that's my new t-shirt uh probably go up for sale at some point but you'll probably get a lot of crap if you walk around with it so um maybe you better not um i want to thank michelle hood at uh, light to light for sending me this beautiful plate uh, with all the great stones in it and uh i just want you to know michelle my cat sleeps around this thing and loves it and uh we appreciate it and as you guys know i've been uh, traveling around the uh american southwest in the last few weeks months and also watching rex bear over at league project and uh, uh diamond at Oberheimer ranch uh, they're going around all the petroglyphs in the southwest and videotaping them and it's really very thank you guys it's really interesting and the thing is is that they did electric universe guys did these experiments where they uh, did roving electricity like lightning strikes under rocks and sand and when they got done, it looked just like the American Southwest, the mesas with the flat tops and everything. And we know from the petroglyphs and the pictographs that the Native Americans witnessed a plasma event. The thing is, is that you have to ask yourself is, <clears throat> how long does a petroglyph or a pictograph stay on a rock? And erosion eventually will get rid of it. So my conclusion is that it was a an event that happened not so long ago and maybe only a few hundred years ago and that there might be a reason why the cross at Hende was built in around 1600 uh it was at the time of the event and i'm starting to suspect it was so anyway i'm jay widener this is reality check and uh, thank you for watching subscribe and hit like and all the other stuff today we are back with one of our favorites the great johnny enoch Hey, Johnny. How you doing, Johnny? Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me back on your show. It's always, it's always great to be here, and the subjects are never boring. No, um, and uh, <clears throat> really and truly, um, we are moving into the land of Wu right now, and um, there's no turning back. And Wu is everything that is outside the normal uh, view, what's allowed in, in, for the normies to think. So the normies uh, don't like Wu, they don't think it exists, but Wu is everywhere. And once you remove the barriers, you can see the Wu everywhere. And you know, that's what we do on the show is we explore Wu and all the kinds of wooey things that are going on. Now that, um, now that certain events are about to take place, there's going to be a massive waterfall of woo all over everybody and everything. Nobody will be able to escape it. Uh, the normies will probably have to come to us to get advice on how to psychologically take it. And I'm hearing, you know, all sorts of chatter that, you know, the powers be are worried that the normies are not going to be able to handle what's about to happen here. That's exactly it, Jay. And uh, that's the great part about reality check and all of you watching this is that when people start to realize that our reality doesn't work the way that everyone thought it works it's a little bit different it's going to be a big shock and all of you watching this are going to be the educators people are going to come to you for advice they're going to come for you come to you to fill them in to educate them i get this all the time because in my circle I move in all sorts of different areas to do my research, as I know you do also, Jay. I, I talk to intellectuals, I know PhDs, I know professors, I know people that are historians. And once in a while in these areas, let's say when looking at ancient Egypt, for example, I'll get a pushback from Egyptologists, I'll get a pushback from academics and scholars, and they'll say, well, we like what you're saying over here, but this stuff you're saying, let's say, about stargates, uh, about them eating these white cakes that upgraded their materials, all that, they'll say this is absolute nonsense. And they'll say that, you know, this was a very basic civilization that's been around for about 5,000 years. The Great Pyramid was built by Khufu. We have this link to it in the, the Fourth Dynasty, it was used as a tomb. And they will push back at even guys like Chris Dunn with his Giza power plant hypotheses. But when they realize that not only are these subjects taken very seriously, as you know, Jay, they're taken very seriously by very important and powerful people on our planet, as well as military intelligence and others that, uh, you know, we sat down with some incredible people, uh, that the, 
the difficulty is how to explain this to people. And that's why uh, shows like this are allowed to go on. Uh, guys like us are allowed to get the information we do to slowly disseminate this information in bite-sized morsels. And because it is so overwhelming, there's, there's so much to take in. Uh, and what we have is, is sort of a, a cornucopia of, of, of different perspectives to take from. So today, I guess it would be a good point for us to talk about how reality works and then we can move forward to where we're going in the future and the concurrent agendas that are there. Jay, you've covered the Tartarians before and all these sorts of aspects in our, in our you know, different reality that we're in. Would you say that maybe there's parts of our history that we've been blindsided from? Yeah, I think, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Anatoly Fomenko, the Russian mathematician. What mm -hmm. he did was he took, I think it was the, uh, the astronomy software when it first came out in the 90s. And then he would take historical events and then he would, um, he would look at where the total eclipses were and when they happened. And when they happened during an historical event, he would go read the event to see if they reported the total eclipse. And what really got him was, I think it was the Peloponnesian War, where there was definitely a, a, a huge solar eclipse during the time period that we are being told that war was going on, yet no historian, the Greeks did not record a great solar eclipse during that war. So he that that told him there was something alarming here. So he started looking at other things, lunar eclipses and and finding out that <clears throat> that events don't match, but he could find a solar eclipse, you know, uh, uh, in history that did match. So he knew he knew it happened, but he, he he thought that there was like 400 years or 500 years missing. Some people say a thousand. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I think that there is missing time. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think that the Jesuits probably rewrote a lot of uh, history to make the church look more powerful. I don't think there's anything that, uh, there's a lot of historical uh, 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 times when that's been done. The Chinese, the Ming Dynasty would just wipe out everything before it and then rewrite history as, as if they were always in charge. So yeah. I think that history has been altered. And here's the thing. Um, the Swedish physicist, whose name is just now going to escape me, he teaches at Oxford, he postulated that this is a simulation that we're in. And he said that the only real way that you could discover that this is a simulation is to go into the past and find anomalies. And if, because the programmer has limited resources of time and, and space, no matter how much he's got, he's got limited. So he's going to spend more time on the present and the future than he is on the past. So he'll build a kind of a sloppy past so that you go back there and you look, oh yeah, that, what they told me is right. But if you actually do start looking into the past and really dig, whoa, dude, it is unbelievable. You can read historical accounts that don't match each other. Uh, it is, and the, and the further back you go, the worse it gets to the point where, you know, um, just not sure. I mean, I'm just not sure. It looks like something occurred around 1600, 1550, 1600, when we were going into the Maunder Minimum and something happened and uh, it, 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 population, it was almost like a reset of some kind. And I think there are more resets than we uh, really understand. I think the the Great War, which we call the uh, French-Indian War here in the United States, but it was really a world war in, uh, in the 1600s. I mean, it was a gigantic war. It was, uh, countries were fighting everybody. It was a world war for sure, and we don't even know about it. We're not even taught about it. And so you have to wonder what that war was really about. So yeah, I think that there's something wrong with our history, and I think what we've lost uh, We've lost the technology that Fulcanelli was trying to tell us about. And uh, uh, that, that alchemy, while it has things that are, that has uh, chemical properties, what alchemy may very well be, and you can tell this by the titles of uh, Fulcanelli's two books, Mystery of the Cathedrals and Dwellings of the Philosophers. It's, 
it's and this is what, why Egypt is so important. It's turning out that it's where you live is alchemy. And the geometry of where you live and, and the way that she, that's why I tell everyone about these guys from uh, Michelle Hood at Light the Light Pyramid. You've got to do something about where you are. You've got to alchemize your home uh, with, with this thing that they were doing like the Tartarian buildings were doing, like the bubble, the um, onion bubble towers in Russia. They're drawing down these telluric, etheric energies and concentrating them down in the bottom of the house where you live. That's the easiest alchemy of all. And we, are, uh, we live in a profane world where they don't even care now about what they use in buildings and they use metal two by fours and metal roofs and that stuff's gonna throw everything just way off. You see behind me, I live in all wood. My roof is wood, right? I don't have uh, metal outside of the screws that are holding everything together, which is all the metal that I have in my house. And I think you have to really check out where you're living and modify it. I totally agree. and and we go back into those principles that you and I have discussed on other shows before, like what Plotinus wrote in his essay on the beautiful, that the more beautiful your buildings were through aesthetics, the more upgraded that the consciousness of a civilization was. And that's why when you walk through Europe and you see these beautiful architectonics and buildings with their structures, it, it brings out sort of a heightened thinking and a heightened sense of reality. And the ancients knew this, as you mentioned. I mean, look in Russia, like you said, uh, we can link that uh, as you're talking about to these Tartarian groups and whatnot. But look at your mosques, how the top part forms these the heavens opening up. So there, there is a geometry that opens up into these things in this, these, um, this holofractal universe we live in. But you know, it's interesting, Jay. We speak about these mathematicians and their calculations or even predictions that have been made. And we can go back into what the Israeli mathematicians were doing about 15, 20 years ago with Roslin and the uh, Bible code and all these sort of things. And they found that the algorithm for reality and these predictions was so complex, it's, it's really unexplainable. And things that you know, we thought were around many years ago, as you, as you mentioned, and looking in these anomalous situations in our past to find these, these sort of glitches to see that we're living in a simulation reality. Uh, you know, we've most certainly seen uh, Bostrom's work and others who, Bostrom. you know, we look at we look at these ideas, right? Yeah. And also uh, Michael Talbot talked about that in the holographic universe. Great book. But you know, it's interesting. When we look at this idea of reality, as it's been explained to me before, is that our reality, as we look at it, sort of has this superposition function to it that we live in this quantum multiplicities of realities. So if you look at your life, for example, uh, and we're, we're going to get into a, a bit about this, about what, what's happening to us right now and our genetics, why they play a role in this uh, uh, and how reality is coming to us. But if you look at the anagram of reality, and how, how your reality and how your life is coming to you. We know that everything is happening to you in simultaneity right now. The Jay Widener who was eight years old, who was riding his bicycle, maybe eating an ice cream cone, that Jay Widener is doing that right now. Same with all of you watching. As at the same time you're watching this video and the future you is existing at the same time. We know that all of these realities concurrently are existing and happening and what we see with reality is that our current world that we're going into, it is constantly being affected. And there are groups that are also affecting our world. Now, this is where I gotta tell the viewers, Jay, as you gave the warning at the beginning of the show that, you know, when we talk about this woo stuff and these other sort of senses of reality of where things are coming in, is that our reality, as it's been explained to me, is being affected by folks in the future 
they are coming back and trying to correct things. They're affecting us. At the same time, we're being affected by the past. There's certain things that are being inserted in our reality. And there are different cooks in the kitchen, if you get my drift. There are different groups that are affecting us that have different intentions that foresee what we need to do. Let's call these the gardeners of humanity or the caretakers. Um, now, where this gets a little confusing, as you and I have discussed this before, you might say that there's two different groups. And I say groups because I'm using that very lightly. This is a much bigger subsection than just, just a small little area of, of a description. There's, you could say there's one group that wants to see our progress be sped up. And they want to see us go further and they believe that we're ready for more. And they're kind of giving us, they're deluging us more uh, with more opportunities to grow and to evolve. And there's one group, let's just say, that wants to slow us down. So you could say that we have different, different groups that are putting their horse in the race, so to speak. And uh, when we look at your consciousness as it is today, everybody watching this, you might say that this, this really is sort of how the driving force of this works. So what we got to understand when we look at this, and as it's been explained to me, is that this reality that everybody thinks, you know, we share, we all think it's the year 2021, you know, as you, as you watch this show right now, you think, hey, you know, uh, this, is, this is the year I'm living in, and, uh, you know, this is, how, this is where we are. You're this, you know, uh, unique constellation that is uh, of, of language and time and everything that's, that's coming out here. Essentially, this reality that you have today in this time and space where you think you are, that you're, that you're super positioning you know, takes us in, this is imbued into you, this consciousness configuration, this unique constellation of time and space that's being imbued into you as a focal point. But really, uh, this comes into sort of your, where your DNA comes into the picture of where we look at this. And you might say that humanity has had uh, a lot of help. We've been tinkered with at certain times. Our genetics have been tinkered with. And as you and I have discussed this, Jay, when we look at DNA, what does it look like to you? Uh, <clears throat> a spiral. You're talking about the We shape. got the, the, the helix. We got the two sides, right? Two Looks like two coils. coils. Yep. Coils. So essentially, right, we see the two coils on each side look like an antenna. So essentially, when we look at your DNA, everybody watching this, your DNA looks like the two coils on an antenna uh, with the windings for distance. Uh, and essentially, because we know your consciousness is a non-local awareness, there's a non-locality factor to it. We see that these two sides have this particular range. It's like um, they go into this, uh, this range of this duplexing uh, aspect that you, you essentially get this idea that you're receiving a signal from somewhere else. And this signal sort of determines your reality as we come into it. So what happens if we modify this antenna a little bit? What happens if we make some changes to it? And who, who was the one that designed us this way? Who was the one that created us this way? And if we were to change this, what do you think would happen, Jay? Well, I mean, it depends on who's changing us, you know, what, what their intentions are. It could be for the worse. We could be turned into slaves or we could be turned into super uh, healthy, athletic, intelligent, beautiful beings. Exactly. And so when you look at DNA, okay, let's go down into the, the chemical structures, uh, which are, are really unique, okay? If we made even one change to those, okay? So what do we have? We have, you know, chlorine, carbon, ethanol. We have all these different changes. If you take that, that one little change in the configuration, one in a billion, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we're going to change, even one little alteration, we're going to have a completely different perspective. Now, what happens if we start changing that stem, adding on another stem? What if we had a way to alter that for the future uh, of where we're headed? And what if we had uh, a way to sort of change and configure what's under the hood? So you might say that we're a giant zoological project 
to some of these folks. Let's call them the gardeners or the caretakers. So there, there's different means that we could change this. Now, you were talking earlier about these events in history, maybe that have been covered up. We look at the Tartarians, we look at other groups. What if there was a way that we could start modifying our reality and how the reality comes to us? This is like those Japanese sword makers. They, you know, they want to make the perfect sword, so they keep adding edge after edge after edge after edge. That's how you could say our reality is coming to us. But we also have a way, then, if we look at our DNA, we have a way of how our reality is coming. Uh, for example, even you and I watching this video right now, it's rather incredible that when you look at the rods and cones in our eyes, and the photoreceptors, how light is coming in through the eyes, These, this photonic exchange of information goes up and in there into two visual cortices, and somehow the light moves in there, but there's no light in the brain. The brain is completely dark. It comes in there, and we have this thing in the optic nerve, first of all, when things are flipped around. Uh, as Daniel always says, that's the divine has a sense of humor. Uh, you know, we get this thing that's decoded to us, and somehow we're decoding this into information. So if we start looking at, you know, where is our reality come from? Who is dictating our reality? And are things being inserted into our past? Are we given certain words and events and ideas that are going to unfold in longer periods of time? And if you have beings and advanced civilizations and groups that are overseeing our progress, they can move in and out of this, this, these periods in a different way than we can. Uh, if you can move back and forward in time, we move back past what we might call lineal subjugation. So there's no, there, there's no time limitation. The time limitation is strictly something that's been pre-configured with us. We have this linear perspective that we're going forward. Our brain makes us think that, hey, you know, we're moving forward. Time is like a river. You know, you never step in the same place twice. Well, what if there is a way that you can affect this reality? So that's why we talk about this uh, aspect of quantum multiplicity. Now, when we move into this idea, uh, and we look at the ideas that things from our past are relative with the future. We also might look that that other dimensions are affecting us. We're getting affected by beings in other dimensions, which is really interesting. So who's behind this? This brings us into a very interesting idea that you and I have discussed uh, of, of what's taking place right now with extraterrestrial intelligence and who we're connected to, where we come from, and how this works. So uh, I've been told many times, as you have been told also by your contacts and the people uh, that you're in communication with, uh, very knowledgeable folks, is that extraterrestrials are most certainly walking among us, you know, uh, amongst us all the time. Uh, I've been told many times, if you would like to see an extraterrestrial, the greatest thing you can do is go hang around in Venice Beach. Uh, and you'll, you'll see, right? I mean, that's a... A great place for them to fit in. Uh, you know, extraterrestrials are working amongst us with our, our scientists. They're at Oxford. They're in our governments. Uh, we know for a matter of fact they have been for a long time. And that might be a lot for a lot of people to accept, but it's true. We're getting a lot of help. We're getting different innovations and ideas. And what people need to realize before we, we go any further in this conversation today that we're talking about is that there's a lot of people out there that are doing they want to have a lot of fear mongering message and say fear the future and don't you know that they should worry about what's going to happen and hide under a rock one thing i've been told over and over again by the most knowledgeable of sources is that the human race is very protected and while there are going to be all kinds of different um, scientific experiments and things going on in our in our near future for the most part the human race uh, it is protected. It cannot be wiped out uh, by any group, by ex any extraterrestrials uh, or any other group. In fact, for the most part, we're, we're getting help so we can move ahead and, you know, fulfill our destiny, uh, which we will talk about today. But I also want to talk about uh, an idea that how advanced some of these beings are, Jay, that are amongst us, because I know you have information that you can share about uh, what's happening and where we're going and, and who's here and what the agendas are. But some of the type of extraterrestrials that are amongst us, I think, is, are really fascinating. Just some of the ones I've been told about. So some of these beings are, you know, for the most part, they look just like us. Uh, some are a little taller. Uh, they might have larger eyes. Uh, they have a heightened sense of abilities. You know, 
uh, as Cliff Stone, the late Cliff Stone, uh, as of recently, of course, as Cliff Stone used to say, you know, when he talked about his 57 types of beings with Greer at the National Press Club, you know, he said they might be able to walk into a room that's dark and know what color an object is by touching it, uh, you know, without having to look at it. But he would say they have a heightened sense of smell and taste. Well, I've also been told we also have amongst us these artificially programmed uh, chimeras beings that can have an energetic formation. So what I mean by that by a chimera is that it can change shape. Uh, it can literally have this uh, photonic uh, light structure rearrangement and it can in, you know, have interactions with folks. And there also is almost a artificially rearranged chimera structure that's sort of like Avatar, the movie Avatar, where it's almost like if folks can Re, uh, project themselves here be in a situation so these um holographic structures could be interacting with people in certain positions or places and have this configuration that they're in the room with you with this uh denser subatomic structure that could even shake your hand or hand you a document or something and then disappear uh you know i've heard in our own holographic technologies we've had for over 30 that we've had that sort of technology to do that ourselves. So the interesting part about this is that most certainly uh, we are being influenced from all sorts of angles. Yeah, I remember uh, it was a YouTube about 10 years ago of a car accident. <clears throat> it was a traffic cam and it was a car accident. It was here in the United States and uh, out of the blue, a priest appeared, walked up to the car, did the last rites on the person who was dying in the car, and then right in front of our eyes, he just disappeared. I mean, he just like was gone. It was a, a freeway, there were no trees. It was just like, you know, he couldn't have gone anywhere. There were police there. It was just, I'll never forget that one. And I've seen other ones like that. And of course, we've all experienced it too, if you think about it. Now, I've been told that they uh, really like Las Vegas. <laughs> I have no idea why, but I've been told they really like it. And if you really want to see them, go to the tables, the gambling tables in Vegas, because they like to gamble. Oh, yes. Jay, uh, I've, I've heard several stories, not just from our friend uh, Charles Hall, who were he was talking about the talls, the tall whites, Yep. And the tall whites are just a, I think, a colloquial name for his experiences with groups that have been coming and going here for some time. There's been different groups that come here. One of the reasons the tall whites needed to come here periodically is due to this um, genetic factor that their their bodies and bones would start to really hurt them. Uh, you know, in certain uh, with certain atmospheric changes and and gravity and all that. So when they would come here, it would actually uh, help them in many ways. They would they would need to come here for periods of time over at the Nellis Air Force Base. Right. But uh, I've heard the stories about in Vegas where these folks were walking around and they you know they were literally tearing up the place. At some point, there are certain places being just completely destroyed, and their handlers were over there and they were walking around in disguises and glasses. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Vegas is uh, a hot pit. One of those ones like Venice Beach. Yeah, but I was, um, I was in Denver. Or this was like maybe eight or nine, no, maybe ten years ago. Now I wasn't living in Colorado at the time. I was living up in Oregon, and um, I got, I got uh, I, Jesse Ventura asked me to be on conspiracy theory, wow. so I, I to do the Denver airport, you know, my the conspiracies around Denver airport. So I said, yeah, what the hell? I want to meet Jesse. So um, I met him, and I was on the show, and I had a great time. But I had a layover. He left at like one in the afternoon. My flight wasn't until like eight o'clock at night because, you know, Oregon's just a small, a small town in Oregon. So very, very specific flights. So I had to wait. So I went to the, I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit down here on the moving sidewalks. Thousands of people are going to come by me while I'm sitting here and I'm going to wait and I'm going to uh, pick out the aliens, right? See who are the aliens and who aren't. So I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm having a really nice time. And it's about two hours into this. I haven't seen much of anything that got me. But as I was looking down the moving sidewalk coming at me, I saw this, I think, a woman 
and she had clearly a wig on, giant sunglasses. Um, uh, she had a, 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 a turtleneck or something that went up to here. She had long sleeves and gloves on, right? And you could see behind the um, sunglasses, you could see her, the only part of her skin that you could see. And it was paper white. And I mean paper mm -hmm. white. And I looked at her, I went, oh my God. You know, and I, I was staring at her. She saw me staring at her. And as she went by me on the moving sidewalk, she turned her back to me so that I couldn't see the skin anymore, right? And then when she went by me, she turned around and looked away from me. So I never got to, but I had one. I know I had one for that brief moment. And I don't know what I'd be like the dog, you know, chasing the car. I don't know what I would do with it when I, when I got it. But um, yeah, it's also the, um, you know, the mummies that we found in, uh, in Peru and in Nazca. I mean, those were real and uh, they were, I don't know if they were aliens. I don't know. You know. Their DNA wasn't human, but you know, so yeah, they're here. And um, uh, you know, the fact that we didn't blow each other up during the cold war is kind of proof that somebody benevolent is watching over us. And, it's, and I'm not talking about God or something. I'm talking about something more physical here. That's making sure that we don't screw up. And I do believe you're right. They're, they're, they're taking us to another level. And there's a lot of fear in that for us. Now, we know that the, the Navy has been telling the mainstream media here in the United States for the last six weeks that they, that as recently as 2019, that their ships were paralleled by flying saucers that the saucers would hover above the helicopter pads on the destroyers during top secret missions for hours and would travel with them at 16, 20 knots, whatever they were going, which is a pretty good clip in the ocean. And, um, <clears throat> and the Navy never tried to, to, um, to uh, attack them or to try to get a sample of what it was. They, they weren't drones. They didn't have propellers on them. And uh, they were 50 miles out at sea. So you, whoever, if it was a drone, you know, you're what? You got eight mile line of sight, something like that. So they would have to be within eight miles. And they have, they have these Aegis programs on these ships, which can see everything around them. Uh, 360 degrees all the way around them. They can see what's under the water. Um, so the whole, the whole thing is, is that, yeah, okay, this happened. Why is the Navy telling the mainstream press? And the answer is because they're being told that either you do it or we're going to do it. And do it is show themselves. That's it. Now, th this goes back to our original conversation as well with this cross pollination of reality. Okay, so we could, you know, if we want to be like quantum theoreticians for a moment and we want to go into the, the fact that we're getting that. 100 billion trillion resets per a second uh, of reality that's constantly being changed. We have to look at these craft and these uh, structures that are coming here, these, uh, let's call them platforms, these, these things that are coming in and out of our reality and how they're able to, to instantly appear or disappear. There's a certain science that they have. Our navies know it. Uh, our militaries know it. And again, this goes back to this struggle about these groups that we talked about, of one group that wants to speed us up, that thinks that we're ready in our evolution for where we're going. They want us to get the information. And there's another group, let's just call them the, the gardeners of humanity, the caretakers. They see things a little bit differently. And there, there are certain changes that we're going through. But how it's been explained to me, uh, I've, been, I've been explained uh, in a couple of ways of how these craft work in, in sort of layman's terms of how some of them are kind of changing. And one of the things that I've been told about is, you know, when we look at the idea of when we use the lasers at the Lure Observatory, for example, you know, we're shining lasers up at the moon. Sometimes the laser that we shine up to the moon takes a little longer to get back than it does, you know, to get there or vice versa. You know, there'll be a change in how this goes. Um, and what I've been told about this is, for example, 
we can look at the ideas of, of gravity, for example. I was told, look at gravity in its relation to electromagnetic propagation. Uh, one of the things I've been told is that when you take electromagnetic, uh, an electromagnetic gravitational wave and propagation, uh, when we go outwards, does it stop to propagate or does it nullify? Uh, one of the things that I've been told with our lasers that we're using, for example, and how this relates even to a craft and whatnot, when we look at like a photonic science, uh, is that when we see the speed of light, who says that the speed of light is finite? Who, when we, when we give the speed of light sort of a measurement, who says that it only has one measurement, one kind of measurement that we can actually attach to it? So what I was told we have to think about with these craft and the things that we're seeing in the sort of science that's coming out with this is the idea that we can change this at, uh, let's say, a subatomic level at the nuclei. Let's say we take this, this negative charge with an electron when we take one of these, these lasers and we shoot them through another medium or a media or we, we bring it out through another material, let's say we've changed the charge of this on the photon and put it through the right structure. One of the things I was told is that if we want to change this, we can actually send, um, send a particle, of, uh, for example, through media a quadrillion, quadrillion times and we can start changing the different, the different aspects of how it travels. And so what we can do with these craft is that we can actually look at our reality like the layers of a dermatitis, like an epi epiderm epidermal layers, like even of the skin, if you look at reality, look at the universe, look at these dimensional structures, how they work. So essentially going back to what we were talking about before, with harmonics and harmonic resonance and even how you can change the atoms in the body on how they might vibrate differently so if they're not relative to the floor below you you could drop right into the floor below you uh if they're not relative um we could just flick a switch on one of these craft so that you could not only move in and out of reality but different configurations of reality and start to change it into these aspects and, and go beyond this uh, current understanding we have about what it means to travel at the speed of light and looking in those sort of areas. So we have different ways that these craft are getting here. But you know, it was it was explained to me very interestingly enough, uh, Jay, when we look over at how the craft are getting here, I just made some notes before we came on the show here. And normally I don't, but I wanted to talk about this uh, as it was explained to me. One of the things I was told is that how we can understand these craft is by looking at, let's say, a fish in nature. So, uh, as I was told, you go to the top of a mountain, and we have water crashing down the top of a mountain. Uh, and as the water crashes down the top of the mountain, uh, it's it's a stronger sort of more forceful flow. So, uh, you know, if we if we wanted the more peaceful place to sit into this configuration. Uh, we wouldn't want to sit at the bottom either because the water is going to come gushing there as well. So we want to go to about the middle of the stream. So let's look at a fish. Let's say we have a nature. Uh, if any of you have ever taken a walk, I don't know if up by where you are, you've, you've, you know, you've taken a walk, you've seen the spawning salmon before. And, the, and when the salmon are spawning, they have this way of sitting in the middle of the water, even if it's very, uh, if it's just gushing out there, it's very turbulent. And they don't move. They just kind of sit in the same spot effortlessly. That's right. Well, I was told that this is the exact way our UFOs uh, and even our submarines can move around because essentially what we have there is an electroline. Uh, around the fish, it has this slime coat. And the slime coat, it has this force field that it sort of forms around the fish. And not only does it protect the fish from bacteria, as we know, but it creates an ambient electric current through these nanobacteria yep. that are around the fish. And by doing so, it's like a force field, the atoms change. And this is exactly how, as it was, was explained to me, that our UFOs are able to move not only at very fast speeds underwater and through our atmosphere, move around, almost zip around like this. We can change the uh, harmonic resonance. We can move in and out of objects and reality. Uh, but also, this is how our submarines move. Well, uh, yeah, Victor Schauberger, the great mm -hmm. uh, German uh, scientist, he was a, a, a forester in the Black Forest. And <clears throat> he looked down at a super fast rushing stream and saw a trout just sitting there. Not just, it was moving, undulating slightly, right? Yes. And, and he stuck his stick in the stream and the stream tore the stick out of his hand. That's how fast moving the stream was. Then later, 
you know, he noticed the salmon jumping up, you know, 15 foot waterfalls. And he, you know, he, he figured he looked at the, at the, at the physique, of, physique of the salmon and realized it was impossible <clears throat> for them to have the push on their, on their own body to get up that high. And then he began realizing that as the water flows this way, there's also a countervalence going this way of pure electric, electromagnetic charge. And that the fish, just like you said, because of the shape and the slime, they were able to use that uh, to their advantage. And that's why uh, UFOs are fre frequently described as cigar shaped the old cigar shape where you have the, the tapering off to the end, right? Because that's what it looks like. If you're looking at it from a certain angle, it looks just like a fish from above, right? A fish has that cigar shape from above if you're looking at it. And so, yeah, it's, it's the shape, it's the power, and it's the slime. And yeah, the, uh, uh, Victor Schauberger was taken into the U.S. military at the end of World War II and did a massive download to him and when they were done, they kind of just threw them away. But um, yeah, that's exactly right. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Schalberger because uh, that's exactly the, the connection there. People need to realize that 98 to 99 percent of all life is existing in nanobacteria and and below at the quantum subspace. And we have this, uh, you know, electric electrical magnetic you know, field that's moving in everything, even how spiders travel, or we know in the guidance systems of birds, and there is this, uh, for the lack of better terms, or the back, lack of better words, a subject that you've covered before, you know, this electric universe that's yeah. all around us. Uh, and of course, we got to throw the, the plasma in there. But you know, this leads us back, Jay, to the idea that if we have these various realities that are coming at us, these uh, uh, cross pollinations of reality and, and how they're being disseminated and who is affecting us and where these agendas are going, what then do we look at in these vehicles of perception that we have? Each and every single one of you watching this has a unique neurophysiology and biodiversity, meaning that your vehicles of perception are all very, very different. You've all been pre-configured, you decode reality differently. Um, these neurological and physiological discharges that you all have day by day as you're interpreting the reality around you. So then we might say, okay, so what's going on with this giant genetic experiment we have now? Because Jay, you and I have, discussed a lot of things in the previous shows like calm before the storm and uh, those kind of shows and people have emailed us a lot and said well those are very interesting things you guys had discussed and now all those things are starting to take place with immunity passports and where are we going with that so uh you know we we look at these ideas for example of these things that are uh out and yes those things and Jabberwockies. Yeah, there you go. Why, why are there so many of them? So first of all, we did say there'd be hundreds of them. And uh, there's not going to just be one or two. Uh, this is a $36 trillion industry. And it is going to get even bigger over the decade. There, there is most certainly something in place that we can talk about there. So first of all, let's, let's talk about the two that are talked about the most. They're uh, the, tech, the biotechnology that is used there. Uh, biogenetic technology. So we have a technology that is starting to come out that is, of course, mRNA. So talking about that, what do we have there? Why is that so important? This is a very important technology. First of all, it was discovered by a Hungarian biochemist. Uh, that doesn't surprise us because uh, a lot of the greatest inventions in the world have come from the, the Hungarians, uh, who, of course, have been called the Martians. They're, they're scientists, and um, most certainly with them, we know that they gave us, you know, a lot of our Nobel Peace Prize winners. They, the, who they are, who uh, is a very interesting topic where they come from, by the way. Highest IQ. Uh, you know, when we look at the Hungarian the scientists. highest IQ on earth. Hungarians do. Uh, overall average. Hungarians have the highest IQs on earth. Absolutely. They're, they're not from here, by the way. Uh, so the... The one thing is, I will say that with that, I mean, look at look at what they gave us. You know, the 
the discovery of the helicopter, the uh, of the invention of the helicopter, discovery of vitamin C, you know, that gives the Rubik's Cube, the list goes on and on, the hydrogen bomb, all those kind of things. So the one thing is with that, this mRNA technology, it was originally discovered to uh, look at, you know, treating cancer, which is where, you know, they will go with it in the future. With it, it is a very interesting technology. Uh, first of all, what we see is that in its current stage, it's very premature. We know it does have genetic mutations down the road, which is very interesting, which is why these, these first sets are very premature and rushed. Uh, and there's going to be uh, a lot of needs for, you could just say, upgrades in the future with those. Um, there is sort of a, a program in place with those. Uh, not all of the candidates out on the market right now are that way. There's, there's a few different candidates, as you guys know. But why is it that this thing is so important right now? Uh, and how does that work with the sequencing, we might ask? Well, let's just say that when one of these comes into the human body, what tends to happen is there are billions of nanoparticles there. There's more nanoparticles, you might say, that are going into a person than there are the population of the people on Earth. The population of the people on Earth, let's say you have uh, 35 billion. You, you have this, this huge number that's going in there. Secondly... Thing, it's not a theory. This is, this is, they've admitted this, folks. Yeah. Absolutely. And you might see that there is sort of a, a chimera structure here. Uh, was you might say a small carrier gene that comes along into this where there's a huge genetic experiment going on. And so you might say that we're looking at a combination of smallpox, malaria, a uh, form of West Nile. Um, there's all kinds of experimentation that's happening with what we've talked about before, CRISPR-Cas9, and how you can modify uh, DNA. You look over at the idea of when you decide on a sugar carrier, where we're going, and how that happens. But you might say this might be this might be a lot for a lot of people to take in. But you might say, let's just say theoretically right now. Let's just say theoretically. What if there was a way that you could control genetics? You could, you know, cause, you know, sort of a, uh, to motivate the genetic ideas like a, a nano mobile genetic remote control that you could cause it to evolve up or down or move in certain ways. You might say that, what if you could do this for a form of harmonics? Um, so when we look at the, uh, the principles of, let's say, resonance again, or oscillation uh, with, with, with and how we're doing this. Let's say that you know, we had this means of, of moving this around the planet. Now, when you see what, what's happening right now, as Jay and I have discussed before, there is, sort of a complexity to this. There's a multiple reasons why you would roll something out like this. First of all, as you can clearly see, we have this digital concept right now of everything moving into what we've discussed before with immunity passports, with your sort of digital identification. What you're going to find very, very quickly is that these immunity passports are going to change into, as we've discussed, biometrics, and they're going to become biosynthetic. Now, what do we mean by that? Okay, first of all, when you go to places like the UK, what's going to happen, and it already is this way, if you walk through Heathrow and you're already in the system, it's very convenient to the idea that it says, welcome Jay Widener. You walk through the door and your face is already recognized, your body characteristics. Everywhere in the world, you may have noticed, once you go to renew a passport or anything these days, uh, you have to submit your biometrics. And the biometrics are sort of your unique uh, footprint. Uh, and fingerprint to your body, your eyes, your iris, all those sort of things. And your computers, your software, your cell phone, everything is now implemented with biometrics. It's unique to you. Uh, and that can also in the future adapt to, you know, infrared, your unique signal that can be identified from other places as well. But biosynthetic, what does that mean? That means that right now, let's say somebody managed to cheat the system and they went to a friend that was a health practitioner and they said, well, just take one of these and just shoot it into the trash can and sign my paper. Well, in some cases that might work right now where the technology is being implemented for the next two to three years. For about two to three years, that and will be slowed down. A lot of people are getting uh, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, forgery, uh, forgery uh, papers too. That's a big hot thing right now. Yeah, so it's like McLovin from the movie Superbad where he's got the wine idea, uh, ID. Uh, so that might work for a bit, but what, 
what uh, I've been told is that uh, the GPs don't know this, but there is actually a uh, biosynthetic identifier. So what's going to happen, you know, two, three years from the, down the road, each and every single one of those lot numbers and things that are on this, they will be identifiable in the body. So they'll be able to see with the nanoparticulate, uh, you know, the ideas of what already is in the body. And once those are in the body, they can't be taken out. So there yeah, is they, view, they have like a something they can view this with and, and yeah and there there is a way of identifying what, what, which uh, which ones are there you got and how many and all the whole thing everything's identified correct now as i mentioned there is a way to sort of activate this and to change it but i i mentioned before that this is nothing to be afraid of overall the sense that we are we are protected but there's going to be over I, I would say, without giving an exact number, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of versions of these in the near future. So what's going to happen is that everybody wants to get their horse in the race. This is a $36 trillion industry. Uh, as people are aware now, there's some that are older technology. There's vector. There's dead and inactive. There's, there's uh, live versions of this. There are different versions that come out for different reasons. Um, you know, the popular one that's from the UK actually is with monkey DNA. There's all different kinds. There's all different kinds of versions. Okay. But this is not something that's going to go over way, go away overnight. So, uh, in fact, it works this in the way that it works in the world, not only for economics, uh, for this, this great re reset of things, as we know that's happening, as for more control, as for change, all these sort of things. Again, we can't go into a place of fear. What we have to realize is that we are making gigantic evolutionary steps into the future at the moment. And so the best thing we can do is come to a place of a, a higher understanding of who we are, what is our purpose as spiritual beings, go back into nature with it. And to go back into our, our core of our being and center ourselves and, and make the best of our lives and move forward as these things are taking place in the world. But what I will say is that, as it's been told to me, is that right now, the big C that we've been told about, uh, the big C has been the, the big concern. But where we're going to move into very, very quickly uh, that we haven't been told about yet is we're going to move into something called the Nipah virus. Uh, Nipah virus it is 75 to 100 percent more infectious than the current one that we're looking at and the thing with the current one that when you look at it the very interesting thing about it is that it had what was it about a uh, 35 to 45 day incubation period that didn't move as fast uh, i think as some had anticipated at the beginning of its rollout um one of the things you noticed that the big the big agenda for this year will be rolling out is we're talking about variants a lot and how these variants work. Yeah. So what the joke about that is, is that it's not really a joke because I want to emphasize that this thing is real, that there is, there, there is a real, um, it is a real situation. It is something that, you know, is here for sure. But the thing about that is, is that you were told, uh, you know, with these variants, whether it's the Kent variant or whatever, whatever name you're going to give it, is that when it first came out that it never affected children and young people. And they said, oh, it doesn't affect young people. So, uh, you know, there's, there's no need to worry about that. Uh, but we know that in China, China had uh, you know, uh, uh, found and identified over 2,500 different variants. So you just pull out a variant from there and they said, oh, look, we found the Brazilian variant. And the Brazilian variant, the, you go and you look at that and you say, okay, Brazilian variant, that variant over there now affects young people. So then the one of these that starts with a P, uh, that one now is being used for, you know, giving to pregnant women and others. I want to emphasize that again, Without giving into fear, without giving into uh, getting worried about our future and where we're headed, we have to stay vigilant and, and hopeful for the future, and we have to trust that we're here for a reason. Uh, I will tell you that it is, I would say that it's a, a, a very strong possibility, is how I'm going to word this, that in five years' time, you will be told that there is mass infertility and sterility. You, and I'm not saying any certain one of these that is involved with it. I'm just saying that you might find that. You're also yeah. going to be told uh, that in the next 10 to 15 years, 
that there is an idea that, as Jay and I have discussed, that if you want to reproduce, there will be sort of a QR code, you could say, uh, for ethical reproduction. You might say it's like the social credit score, that it will be more towards uh, determining the genetics that you want, uh, like designer babies. This will be something that is going to move forward. However, when it is suggested that you move by be between now and the end of the decade, and I, I want to say that I think you have about five years. You still have five years to naturally reproduce. So I want to say that. When we move towards the end of the decade, what's going to happen is that it's going to be one of those things that if you want to you want to do this it's going to be have it's something that you know you're in a special class of people that's aligned a certain way jay uh as you and i've discussed before one of the things we will see in the near future with this trade-off that we're making for the human race our lifespans are going to be extended with life extension technologies is that something you've looked at as well yeah in fact i am <clears throat> very interested in that of course um it, it seems to me being as careful as you are, that they're going to, what they're trying to do, one, one of the things that they're trying to do is find out, like, take, find out, they're looking for a certain kind of human. Let me put it to you that way. It has certain qualities. And that that human has been targeted to advance because of those qualities. Then there's a lot of humans that don't have those qualities. And they're not gonna make it. And that's, you know, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that. And I don't know what those qualities are, by the way. I just been told that they're, they're using all of these uh, things that they're bringing out, not, 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 not those. I'm talking about uh, the way that society has been changing over the last year. And that is giving them a way to kind of sift through the population and see who's who. And now they're choosing who's who. And uh, again, I don't know what the qualities are. I don't know if it's a high IQ or handsomeness or, you know, I don't know what it is or being rich. You know, I don't know. So, um, but I know that I've been told that and that makes a lot of sense. So like we've told, said in our other previous program, you know, expect, expect to be attending a lot of funerals. That's all I'm gonna say. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things with this certain type of human, I'm very glad you brought this up. In the next two to three years, uh, we will see the infection rates go up as these things go throughout the planet. I, I wanna say that more so we see this, this new sort of human coming together. I would look at the idea that what you're going to find, uh, I mean, a lot of the infection rates that you have is non, non-reportable data that has, you know, been briefed to certain folks in certain places. You know, they've talked about, they talked about 300 million infections, uh, you know, in the next two to three years, more like going up into the, possibly we could be looking at, you know, in the billions, one to 1.2 billion or something like that in uh, mortality rates and stuff like that they talk about. But without getting into fear-based statistics, the one thing is I want to reiterate that the human race is very protected. So I've been told again in the uh, questioning that I've been allowed to have with, with folks in certain knowledgeable places uh, in, with scientific backgrounds and whatnot, uh, that at no time will the human race ever be wiped out. So we will never be wiped off the face of the earth. So I want to get that out of everyone's mind. A lot of people out there, they're going to think, hey, that this is a big, uh, a big race to get rid of us. It's not. So how it would work is kind of like a slow die out that certain folks, as Jay was saying, certain folks that, you know, are making progress, uh, they will be given sort of a pass, a green light to go into the go into the future on their progress and how they're making it into this disposition. And it's not necessarily all a genetic marker, but you might say, okay, it could be like a, uh, the social score. Like, let's say what you get on social media these days, or even how we have to be so careful describing things. Do you match a certain candidate for somebody who um, acts a certain way? Do you have a certain idea of uh, what, 
what are your tendencies? Are you someone that has certain predilections, proclivities, or uh, activities, or hobbies, or are you a, um, a certain type of person that fits into society a certain way? You know, we can only speculate. We can only postulate on what that might be. Uh, but yeah. one of the things, Go ahead. yeah one one of the things I I want you to think about. Everyone watching this, I I want you to think about just what if, just perhaps. Um, we go back and listen to what Ray Kurzweil said at Google's Alphabet. And I'd suggest you guys pay close attention to Ray Kurzweil, sure? a very interesting guy at Google Alphabet, uh, who's looked at nanoparticle technology uh, and uh, how you might say that this is the future uh, of our technology. And what I mean by that with these nanoparticles, we've talked about uh, nanoparticles also, the silicon hexagonal little structures that work like a buckyball that, uh, that can go inside of your body and change you even at the mitochondria level. So you can use nitrogen and hydrogen from outside of your body so you don't need to eat or drink again, or it can slow down cell cellular death. You might say that what we might be seeing right now is also a tech implementation happening right now that's being that's being brought in and swept under the carpet so mrna today for this mrna is not going anywhere mrna when it's perfected is the future it's the future of changing things you could say that it will be used to populate the optic nerves bring back vision in the eyes uh, upgrade super soldiers so uh, and i can tell you right now that there are classified technologies where they've used nanoparticles in the lungs to breathe uh longer or put it into the eyeballs of rats to have night vision or to now we've moved into the infrared which is amazing uh but we could say that you could turn off certain things uh, for uh, certain feelings, for example. You could go in for a super soldier. You could have them to focus. You could, you could do all kinds of things to, to grow back limbs very quickly and to have right. that. Um, you might say that Jay and I have talked about the Georgia Guidestones before. Jay, do you remember the number on the Georgia Guidestones? Yep, 500 million. Um, <clears throat> that's worth the and And Ted Turner, by the way, is behind... Uh, a lot of that um, Georgia Guidestone stuff, by the way. Uh, I don't know if he actually paid for it or whatever, but I just heard all the rumors. And of course, we can um, do a quick recall on the meeting, I believe in Manhattan in 2007, where it was uh, Turner and Gates and Oprah and Georgie from Hungary and uh, the whole gang was there. We don't know what the meeting was about. The rumors are that it has to do with But we don't know, but we do know that the guard outside the uh, meeting reported that Oprah came out crying. Don't know, can't tell you. But yeah, they're gonna, the, the, and I think that I think that, you know, what you're saying is, let's just do a recap really fast so we, people understand. You're not going to be, you're going to, you might be able to hide and away and not get scanned, but eventually you're going to get scanned and they're going to find out that you didn't take any of the, right? That's where we're headed here. And, um, and, and that, I believe you, I believe that's inevitable. So then it comes down to, do we know which of these um, are safer than others? Yes. Uh, so I have asked that question myself. And so in my conversations uh, with people in the scientific and medical world, I can tell you that there is apprehension towards the earlier uh, M-based uh, biotechnology we talked about because it is in its premature stages. And it's, uh, as I've been told, and as we've discussed before about is this the, seven- uh, company, Is this the company that rhymes with Miser? Yes, yeah, so that type, that type of technology is very premature right now, that biogenetic technology. And so there are means to change. Uh, the sequencing in that uh, does look like there's gonna be a need for follow-ups upgrades and changes. And if you have taken it, I don't want anybody to be in fear. You know, essentially, I don't want you to worry. But in the future, there's going to be other 
upgrades and changes, you know, between the next seven to 10 years, there could be other things showing up in the body as in uh, where that goes, because it was originally developed for cancer. In the future, it will be used to treat cancer. It will be used for certain technologies. It's a biogenetic technology. It's not going anywhere. Let me ask but, you a question. I'm very interested in what you have to say. I didn't want to interrupt, but um, is there all these companies are, are competing with each other, right? For this $35 trillion industry, right? Yes. Is there a, a, a overarching um, power above them that, that is making sure that they're not, that they're doing what they're, what you're saying they're doing? Well, there's definitely, from my understanding, there's sort of instructions that come down about what needs to happen and that that's at the top of the chain and then you have this dissemination of these instructors that go down into these these worlds pharmacologically what needs to happen sort of guidelines and whatnot so it's a, there's all sorts of experimentation that's allowed to happen but the idea is is that it's a soft sort of rollout and we're treated you know very much like this basic reward system like the rat getting the cheese to go out of the maze so uh, as you and I discussed even into the last year that we would have these rolling sort of lockdowns where we'd go in where, you know, they would put their foot on our neck for a bit, take it off, put the foot up and then let it open up just like we're going to see come up, uh, you know, in the implementation of the immunity passport and stuff. You'll see a little bit of little bit of travel come through uh, with some restrictions in various areas and regional areas with variants and all that throughout this year. But, you know, we'll be given the permission to take a little bit of travel here and there as we slowly slowly start to implement this out. But if I would have to say, I'm not endorsing any of these per se, I'm not putting an endorsement, so please don't put that on me that I, um, I'm saying that. But if I were to say that if I were to look at any of them right now on that list, that would seem to me that probably to be the most, uh, I would say the most regular of these candidates. I would actually probably look at the idea of, let's say, the J&J &J one, because the J&J &J one, uh, and I'm not telling, you know, I'm not giving endorsement to any of them. Please don't quote me on that. But the J&J &J one is a single, uh, single dose application, and it's based on something that is dead or inactive. However, with the other ones, we have these various technology, biotechnologies. We know that there's 160 of them right now in development, and there'll be, there'll be three or four new ones that come out by the summer, and there'll be there'll be even more into the next year. But as we mentioned, uh, I mean, we, we have something right now coming out, they're gonna be talking about NEPA, another one. So once they get a little taste of this, this works better than anything. This works better than an environmental program, anything. I mean, you're still gonna see that once that moves into the digital stuff, remember you and I said this last year, that you're gonna get to a point where you can't go out to, uh, go to the store to buy milk or bread or can't do anything unless you have uh, an immunity passport and people said in the comments section they said oh that's crazy you know that won't ever happen and sure enough here we are so very soon what you'll have after this sort of interface is put in you're going to see more and more what's happening economically there will be of course we talked about universal basic income which will come uh you're going to have the economic side of it you're going to have uh cash will go out and it will be implemented into these and it will happen quicker than people think but again do not give in to fear. Do not give in to uh, worry with these sort of things. That's not going to change this. We will we will move forward in the future. One thing I want to bring back, Jay, is we talked about the Georgia Guidestones and how this relates. So, again, recapping what we had said, and this is more esoteric knowledge for people. For some people out there, they might not believe that uh, people in this world communicate using ciphers, symbols, and codes, but they do. The Georgia Guidestones were built... Uh, if you look up the date, as you mentioned, it's been uh, postulated that, you know, Ted Turner was behind it. It was what, what was it, Christian of the Rosy Cross or something? They gave him a Rosicrucian name? Christian, and it was uh, consecrated on March uh, 22nd, 1980. Right. 3, 22, 1980. 80 is a quad, quad equals quarantine. Yeah. Uh, the quarantines that took place over exactly. in Europe, the exactly. 322 Four years later, by the way, was the lockdown. Yeah. And look at, I mean, not to get too conspiracy theory wise on you guys, but if you use the, the cipher that, that's used by secret societies, you look over at uh, the letter C, uh, that's number three. 
V is 22. So as you can see, there's, there's some things in there that you could connect. Uh, and if you look on the door of a very uh, interesting sort of club that's over at uh, Princeton, you know, that it's got the Yale. skull and the bones, you see Yale. the 322 and it's yeah. Genesis, exactly, Genesis 322. It talks about, you know, partaking of the, the fruit and being the, the sort of the gardeners that, that go on, that have the longer lifespan. So yeah, our um, healthcare system uh, under um, President O was put in to, uh, signed into law on 322. Yeah. So, I mean, there's an interesting connection to numbers, but as it's been explained to me, the Georgia Guidestones, and again, we go back to the beginning of our conversation on how reality works, how uh, there's long-term plans, okay? Like uh, even in China, with, uh, today we have G, uh, you know, that isn't an, that's not a small plan. We've discussed this before. Uh, Danny Estelin has discussed this on your show, how China is not a country. It is a civilization, a very intelligent, well-planned out civilization. It doesn't have a president. It has an emperor. And its plans don't happen overnight. Uh, they plan for hundreds of years. They have dynasties. They have ways. They have the, the five groups of families. They plan things very, there's a very clever sort of machination that goes on there in the, uh, how they roll things out. They experiment. So from, they check the experiment. Then they re-experiment. Uh, they're not rash. They're not spontaneous. It's... No, back from all C2, all of them, they just, it gets carefully rolled out in a very particular way. They, they have their own agendas, as we'll get into, that they're working with uh, a sort of extraterrestrial group, uh, as, it's been, as it's been told to me by folks in certain places. And that's where they're getting a lot of their technological innovations and, and military development, as well as that is why they have 80 million empty apartments uh, and condos and buildings and stuff. And they're also building them all over Africa. But the one thing is with them, this relates to the Georgia Guidestones. I was told very particularly, um, you could say by folks in a certain world that operate like this, that the Georgia Guidestones don't refer to the limitation of the population being like everybody being destroyed down to that number. Uh, I was told to look at it as that 500 million are like the 500 million that you might want to look at that could be hybrid people or 500 million that would be not from here, but it would shock everyone too much to see them all come here at once. So essentially you might say that rather than everybody being wiped out, that's not the plan. The plan is, is that most of you watching this, a good number of you watching this, if you're lucky in the near future, uh, and this might sound crazy today. I want you just to, to put this as a possibility. A lot of you watching this are going to be around in the year uh, 20, you know, in 350 years from now. You're going to be around for that long. Uh, and as it's been explained to me, I can't go too much into detail about this at this time. But what's going to happen is that not only in the near future are we going to unlock the mitochondria and the cells and we're going to unlock cell death and stuff like that. So you're going to go beyond that, which is why the Earth's population is going to, uh, the way that we repopulate, it's going to change. I know that might sound unethical today, but it, it is just what it is with these different advanced civilizations. If you talk to ET contactees and people, how it is, they talk about the greys, how the greys are doing experiments on us. They're looking at us because they, some of them have lost their reproduction capabilities are, are, and they are, they're looking back at us and they're, they're, they're trying to do these different experimentations with hybridization and everything. You might say that in the future, outside of that, there's going to be a type of technology uh, about 50 years from now, I've been told is when uh, we will have it after about, uh, uh, you know, we go through the changes in the 2030s after the big magic number for these groups is around 2045. They said, we're going to get to this super high tech civilization that is going to move very, very quickly. Um, in those years ahead, you're going to have sort of a consciousness driven biology, a consciousness driven body structure that uh, can sort of rearrange itself or have certain means to, to live at very long extended periods. There are gonna be ways to unlock the human genome that are gonna get you know, spooky. So there, we're in for quite a ride, and this is sort of the evolution that we're gonna step through. But uh, Jay, what have you heard uh, about this, this idea of, of you know, basically long, longevity or immortality? 
Well, um, let's just try to be uh, as uh, exact as I can. <clears throat> I think they're going to reduce us down to a manageable number. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Then they're going to introduce the life extension technology, which is essentially going to be uh, mRNA, I think. I think they've already got it. In fact, I've been told they've already got it. And there's people walking around that are, you know, very, very old. So I think, um, I think that you're right. We're going to, uh, people, there's people watching this that are going to live to be, if you can get to 300, you're going to get to 1,000. Let me just put it to you that way. And here's what here's what's really kind of amazing is a lot of this technology has been bottled up in secrecy, as we know, and but worked on and understood by human beings, usually working in that five sided building in, in, in DC and, uh, and, 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 and like Fort Detrick and other places. So <clears throat> When these events begin occurring, we're already, they're already occurring, but when they get ramped up, which is soon, uh, we are going to be moving from a type three to a type two civilization, uh, vastly uh, moving into a type one. And uh, that is our destiny. And that is what the outside entities want. And the only way that can happen is through what you're describing. And it, you know, I know people don't want to hear it. And, you know, I'm certainly don't want to hear it in a lot of ways too. But at the same time, I can see the inevitability of it. <clears throat> and Terrence McKenna used to always tell me, I never understood what he was saying when he said it. He used to say, Jay, the future is going to happen all at the same time. And I was like, what? How can that be? And now I understand what he meant. And I don't know how he got it. Maybe it was intuition. But you can see that suddenly everything's going to be unleashed on us. And that they're getting us ready for it. And that's what this whole lockdown has been. And everything else that's been going on, it's, it's a prep. It's a prep. It's also uh, designed to do other things. But uh, they're going to start releasing information on life extension that's going to be absolutely mind blowing. It will be, and and I love that that you were friends with Terrence, and also your impersonation was spot on when he talked about the eschaton and everything. That's that's the amazing stuff. I can't believe that uh, how well you knew Terrence. With uh, with what we're talking about, though. Just to give people a little bit of perspective, I want you all to just picture this for a moment. There are more planets in our galaxy than there are grains of sands on all of our beaches on Earth. I just want you to think about that. And as you think about our evolution that we're going through, I mean, we might seem so important. Every one of you watching this might say, oh, well, we're very important people. You know, we have this incredible, uh, you know, these, these rights and what we're doing. We don't understand where we're going with this. Yes, every one of us is a sovereign being. And your sovereignty is universally important in this universe. It is, without a doubt. But uh, also, you have to know that, just to give you a little perspective, that even 10,000 light years away from here, just 10,000 light years outside of here, there's 20 million solar systems. We have viable life all over those places. And I will tell you that these areas, even 10,000 light years out here, uh, and I got to be careful what I say here uh, because I, there's certain things about this that will come out in time, but those areas are very, very busy places. And there, we're not the only group that is evolving and we're moving along. And in many ways, we're just like children. Uh, we're infants. And so... As we evolve, there's certain things, as you mentioned, Jay, with the Kardashev scale, there's certain things we, we're, we're moving into these type one or type two civilizations where we're learning to harness the power of our star or uh, move out into space. 
uh, we are going to move very, very quickly into this. We're going to be moving more uh, into going out into space in the next next decade. I know a lot of you out there have taken cruises before. You've taken a cruise into different destinations. Well, that will be the future. Most certainly, you will be stepping on to, let's say, uh, celebrity cruises, carnival cruises, and all that sort of stuff. Those will be out in space very much so. And it's going to be... Uh, it's going to move faster than you even can think of in the future when we get into this area. Um, but with that, I also want to say that right now, as we're moving into this with our world, people are going to notice a lot of strange changes. Uh, you and I were just talking about this. Uh, the changes we're noticing already, the kind of tests that are being done on our economy. Remember uh, the other day on the Suez Canal, the ship, with the guy that went out for the cappuccino. You remember that? I do. do you, did you see what he drew in the water before he went into the Suez Canal? Tell everyone what he drew. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, that's going to be a tricky one. Okay, so they had <laughs> PPS, and you can watch uh, all ships where they're going all the time. Right before he went into the Suez Canal, he drew, drew a, um, a male appendage. Just put it to you that way. <laughs> don't know what it means <laughs> yeah no he did i mean he's a very cocky guy uh that's for sure you know uh he's certainly with that, got a lot of uh, ball, uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> he, he most he most certainly did yeah uh, but uh i i would like people to think about the idea of what that did to the economy yeah. Well, what just that little test, let's call it, yep. uh, alongside with, let's say, certain biogenetic technologies, what that can do to a, uh, an economic and political structure of the world. Um, without getting too political, and I got to be careful what I say here, because uh, I really am apolitical. I don't support any political party or candidate or anything like that. I just stay out and I'm a, uh, an observer. This is just strictly analytical. If voting could change anything, it would be illegal. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, without getting political, because, you know, uh, I don't I don't bother getting involved in political conversations with people. It's too too charged. Yep. Um, but strictly analytical, you might say, in this great show that we have there, the folks in this world that make these decisions, you might say that there is a certain female candidate that they have wanted for some time to run things. And you might say she's been picked for a while. The last guy was allowed to be there for a while for certain economic reasons and geopolitical reasons, but they, he ran his term and he served his purpose. So the, the lady that they want to have in there right now, if you can read between the lines, she's been picked uh, prime, prime pickings because she uh, did things exactly like certain folks in certain places liked uh, when she was in power in Oakland and other areas. So the other guy that we believe is running the show right now, uh, who might take an early retirement due to exhaustion and, and medical reasons, and let's say about a year from now, this lady that's going to be running the show has certain ideologies and agendas that fit the perfect idea of where things will unfold to. But I want to stress this, that not much is going to change in the sense of, of how these power structures work in the sense of how they're rolled out. Because this, this sort of rolls along in a certain way that it's being uh, rolled out into a new uh, economic and sociopolitical uh, system. When we look over in to China again, we were talking about China. China got its hands on some technology uh, that they were able to coerce in certain ways to create this digital social credit system that they roll out for their ideas. You might say that we're getting a similar system to that right now. That's kind of watching you. It's using algorithms. Yep. It's mapping you out through sort of an AI. Mm, that's right. Uh, we know that's happening. Uh, and AI is used for everything that we have. So you might say that this is part of the way that the world power structures are being changed uh, very um, covertly in that way. Uh, and we'll get we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, one of the guys that you know we've most certainly kept our eye on the last little while, and I know you have, is uh, Elon Musk with what he's doing with Tesla. Um, have you noticed? Have you, did you watch what was happening with Tesla within the ideas of him talking about Bitcoin, for example? Yeah, 
Yeah, he's he's given a supercharge of Bitcoin, that's for sure. Yeah, and so you might say that, why is that happening? Why is Bitcoin being affected? Well, we could say that right now when he has the doggy coin and all of that, and there's, you could, maybe you might say that there's some cooperation with a guy like Warren Buffett in the background. Um, Tesla, Tesla's profits are kind of taking a slide at the moment, but that's okay because he's doing other space stuff with, with Bigelow. Uh, and from what I've asked about uh, Elon, I, I don't believe that he has more than just a peripheral understanding of what actually has been happening within off-world colonization with Mars, for example. Um, Mars, I know you've heard a lot of things about what we've been doing over the last few decades. Uh, uh, what, what was your last update on Mars that you had? Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a base on Mars. We have several, um, is what I've been told, and on the moon and some of the moons of uh, Jupiter. And um, we're interacting with uh, various ET groups. And um, uh, from what I hear, Mars is not really a very nice place, but I don't know. I've never been there. Yeah, no, exactly. What, we, what I've been told about it is that the places, there are some very deep kind of places that are almost like the Marianas Trench. Uh, up there, you know, we have this residential magnetic core and it's almost like going up into like Everest or something, like if you were to go into these areas for as far as the atmospheric changes. But the, the few places that have been up there for a few decades, it is, uh, you know, developed in that way. But again, Elon Musk only has sort of a peripheral understanding of this and his wanting to go there. And we will, we will be heading into that direction. But of course, we've heard all sorts of elaborate disinformation stories that have come out in this this area about mars that have been very very elaborate yep that have come out by certain people that have these you know exotic and exciting stories but i've been told in the past those were kind of put there in place to kind of throw folks off about what has actually happened it's it's a little bit more uh simplistic in in the developments that have taken place there but there have been there have been projects that have taken place there there is other world otherworldly sort of expansion and colonization that is going around our solar system and places like that for some time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting with Musto, uh, you might say that China's had concerns with his Tesla cars because of worrying about the chips being put in there. China has their own intranet, their own internal internet. So to them, they're, they're very compartmentalized into what they allowed to come in and out. So I do think that's affected him on his projections. So having this whole Bitcoin thing, is most certainly something that he's pushing forward right now. I don't want to call it a complete distraction or a fad or a bubble, but most certainly uh, we might say that when Bitcoin crashes and, you know, when we see it crash, what's going to happen with oil? Uh, price of oil is going to shoot up to the roof. We're going to see all kinds of changes in that. Yeah, but they are moving us away from oil, that's for sure. And we're moving towards um, Gen 4 nuclear reactors. That's the, another inevitable thing that's going to be coming at us here. Uh, we're going to we're going to go totally solar, and it's not going to work <clears throat> because there's this thing called cloudy days, and um, people start complaining as they should, and then we're being slowly led into Gen Four. And since nuclear power has such a bad connotation right now because of Chernobyl and all the rest. Uh, it's going to be part of this 10 year plan, nine years now plan. And I would say by 2025, 2026, you're going to see them start cropping up all over North America. Yes. No, I would say so uh, that we're our, uh, everything that we have as far as our technologies, our energy, our structures are, are going to change. We have some big changes coming up. I'd say that, you and I talked about this, the strange weather patterns that are gonna begin this year. Uh, the water levels are gonna be rising. This, you know, we look at the underwater mantle. This has not so much to do with global warming, but more there's gonna be certain, uh, there's a heating up of, of certain water and, and pressure systems. I mean, there's enough water on this planet to, to reach up even into Everest to cover, cover everything. There's more water in the earth than there is on the surface, okay? so. Uh, people, people know that. The other thing is, is that sort of 
pressure systems and what we're gonna go through. This has more to do with our spatial coordinates as well as our sun and you know where, where we're headed at this particular time. This affects us a lot. And there, there are quite a few things that can happen as far as geophysical events go. You know, uh, one thing that you and I talked about before we did talk about these uh, different uh, weather, weather abnormalities and whatnot, what have you heard about this from your, your sources about what we're headed right now, what's causing it? Well, uh, the uh, diminishing electromagnetic field is causing more cosmic rays to get in. They're, <clears throat> they're, they're exciting the atmosphere, which is causing more clouds to form. They're also, ex uh, when they pierce into the ground, they excite the ground, causing earthquakes and volcanoes. There's 45 active volcanoes right now on the surface, not under the ocean. That's just on the surface. Uh, there are uh, earthquakes swarms now more than ever. And um, dang, it's getting cooler. I don't care what anybody says. I, I know, I can tell you where I live right now, it is, the sun is not as warm as it used to be. It's just all I can say. I mean, if I'm out on a day without any wind and I'm in the sun, it's cooler. I can't tell you why, but it is. This is it. Now, you and I did a show that we, uh, I thought was a very interesting show. We talked about this book over here. Uh, you know, this was a Sylvia Brown prophecy. Yeah. And people might, think, people might think that stuff is too woo, but I know that a lot of our, our military and military intelligence people, they take remote viewing and things like that very, very seriously. Oh, yeah. um, like, for example, you know, we go back into even Mother Shipton's prophecy that we discussed before, that was considered one of the most classified things in, in England for a while, and it was moved over to New South Wales in a library, even going into Australia and places like that. It was, it was actually taken right out of there because of some of the stuff that was said in those prophecies, like around the world, men's thoughts shall fly like the twinkling of an eye, and horseless carriages, and all these kind of predictions that were made are absolutely amazing. So predictions uh, and, and seeing things they do hold a lot of weight. Of course, we know that some of the first psychic examples of these things, we can go back into Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic, uh, and then we move over. You know, we know the Germans were working with this, the Russians with the you know, psychic experiments behind the Iron Curtain. We had Dr. Hal Putoff, Yuri Geller, Ingo Swan, Pat Price with the SRI stuff, Stanford Research Institute. So we know this stuff is taken very seriously from people in high places. That's right. um, but one of the things Sylvia said in there that you and I discussed is she uh, was talking about how she saw in the future there was going to be domed cities. And there would be domed cities with acid rain. So I, I did my best to follow up with that with my sources. I have a few sources that are extremely knowledgeable. And let's just say that they have a very good idea about what's happening, what's going to happen, and the technologies that are implemented with that and what the understanding is from folks in high places about this. They told me that that's not gonna happen. They told me that at, at this stage that that is not part of this particular future that we're gonna have in this current rollout. They did tell me that about 20 years ago, there was already a developed military technology for force fields around buildings and structures, and they do have this technology. So how they told me it works is that it's an invisible force field that you can put around a governmental building, for example, or um, a military base. Uh, and essentially, um, I heard something similar to this when I was out in Belgrade in Serbia. I was doing an investigation about Nikola Tesla and uh, around Serbia and Croatia and stuff like that, which is beautiful. If anyone ever gets a chance to go to Serbia, it's like you can eat off the ground. It's such a beautiful place. I love the Serbian people. Um, but when you're there, they said that Tesla had hidden technology that the Serbs knew about that was in Serbia that he could turn on a force field that could protect Serbia. Um, of course, we go back into Yugoslavia, who knows how that worked. But we, we have this idea about this technology that was there. Uh, so it was explained to me that how this force field worked is that if a bird was to fly into the force field, it would be fine. The bird could go into this electrical force field, but it would reverse on a fast object, let's say like a missile. If the missile came to go hit it, uh, it would destroy it. And how it works is that it's like a uh, airport scanner that you walk through with your body, that it looks at the biorhythms of your body. 
So each and every single one of you watching this has your own unique frequency at about 100 watts. And so not only the trajectory of that missile or whatever it is would come in there, this would be uh, very much a part of it. So I was told theoretically this would be possible through an electrical force field that would look at the um, biochemical structures of things and whatnot and look at the biorhythms to be able to, to look at this, um, this stasis point to be able to bring in this sort of environment in there. But um, I was told not to worry about that, that this would not be an issue that we have to face. Uh, with some of the other things that we were discussing, Jay, um, going back into this idea of who we are and where we're headed currently, and as well as we were talking about these various beings that are here and the technology, the biotechnology of who we are. So what I was told, uh, which is really quite incredible about how we're going to unlock who we are and the biogenetic technology that's here. If you go down to the quantum subspace, uh, or you look at our bodies, I was told that when we look at the subatomic level, okay, we have stuff like quarks, neutrinos, hadrons, leptons, gluons, W bosons, and all that. I was told if you go down to the muons, that we have this space there where you could literally store all the records of all the information in the universe without you know without having to worry about it because the when we try to quantify the information if i if i try to talk to you about information or you're you're you know reciting something that you had learned from folk and Elliot and you're telling me about his books and all that we can't quantify that we can't give it a certain space it just exists in your brain it exists in your mind it's a thought it's a if we bring it in there there's no way that we can give that that space well in there inside your mitochondria for example or inside of one of these areas we have a virtual subspace so we have the ability in this this record or our field of information to unlock that we also have each and every single one of us is very powerful if we know what we're doing we have an entire universe that we can unfold it's not just a, a funny sounding meme or some sort of platitudinous sounding thing to say to one another when you say the universe in me recognizes the universe in you or kind of a namaste you really are a universe you're powerful. You're a powerful being. You know, each and every single one of us can unfold this universe and this idea. Um, I was told uh, that essentially when we apply this state of existence, we are going to use our interpreted consciousness to generate our bodies eventually. That there is going to be a way of unlocking this. Um, I was also told some very, very unique things about... Our, our technologies and the limitations that have been placed upon us. If I were to ask you, Jay, about what do you think is the one technology that we've been held back on uh, that's right under our nose? You know, we've had a lot of developments. Which one's been here the same for about 120 years? Free energy. Right. Yep. Free energy, but more specifically, the battery. Yep. We're still using wet cell batteries. Yeah. So essentially, but we can make a very small- solid state. They have developed solid state batteries now. Right, we can make a very small modification to your cell phone right now so it could run 10,000 years without charging it. That's right. Okay, it's not, it's right. not the hardest thing in the world to do. It already exists. That's right. Uh, I've been told that you know, even if we go look in, in ancient India and these sort of places, I mean, uh, you know, from the, the folks I've talked to even that, that go over there and the, you know, the amazing stuff outside of those incredible temples, the Allura Caves and all these sort of amazing clues that have been left behind us. We know that you know, we had one energy cell there that could last for 30 million years. Yep. We have uh, bodies over there. If you go into India, Pakistan, the Indus Valley, there's bodies that can't be unshielded there still because um, of this, this radioactive uh, aspect to them. So, we have stuff that's been going on on this planet and sort of technologies that have been here for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, we might ask ourselves, who were these folks that were here? Uh, what were their lifespans like and what were they capable of? Jay, how far back do you think these Tartarians go? Uh, <clears throat> I'm inclined to say, um, uh, I, I know this is going to sound really crazy, uh, at least a quarter million years uh at least yeah it could be more um but <clears throat> i'll go with the two hundred fifty thousand because that's what the mitochondria dna is saying 
uh, that modern humans developed about 250,000 years ago. I don't know if that's true or not, but I would say <clears throat> it was a worldwide civilization. Its architecture was used to bring down these electromagnetic forces and to concentrate them both for healing and for power. And uh, they, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there's a force field difference or something, but I, I get the feeling that we're not as psychic today as they were then. And I don't know why. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. There's, there's definitely a change in that. And the interesting part about all of this as well, you know, when we look at how we work and how our bodies work as these bioelectrical fields uh, of information and how our bodies work, we're interacting constantly in different realities. You know, uh, we, we look at guys like Nassim Haramein that looks at the spin of atoms and the angular momentum of spin on, on how that, you know, we're interpreting things and where that's all coming from. Okay, he said that, you know, essentially he constantly tells people that we live in a holographic um, multiverse in a uh, holofractal reality even. I think that's, that's a brilliant way of looking at this and how we're perceiving this in these psychic realities. But what I want you guys to think about is that none of you are really fully in control of your body. Uh, each and every single one of you are, are sharing your body with at least six or seven kilos of other life forms at any time. I mean, this is why we take showers, but at the same time, you are sharing your body. And there's different oscillating cells and things like that. But at the same time, we are also sharing our bodies with these uh, other sort of energetic life forms, okay? You're sharing your body with about 7,000 to 8,000 different other energetic life forms that are attaching to you and moving through you. Have you ever noticed that some weeks you feel really good and vibrant and energetic and inspired and other weeks, you know, you might just feel slow and sluggish like there's something else that you've, that you've come across. And that's why, you know, we, we've seen these sort of clearing techniques and meditations and, and clarity. Essentially, it's like these Buddhist doctrines teach us about this eternal unfolding of self in the external realities and so that's why we want to kind of bring our stuff into that period of nothingness that center of being uh you know you get a really skilled psychic out there or somebody who has the ability as a meditator a psychic if they're really good at what they do they can bring that down to about seven or eight different life forms instead of seven or eight thousand different life forms but those people are usually targeted that these really talented and gifted mediums and seers and psychics, they don't usually live that long. And so you might say again, the only war you're fighting out there at any time, you might think it's outside of yourself. You might think it's in the world or something. You're only fighting that fight against yourself here internally. The real self, as Jay knows, and he's looked at this in years of looking at the esoteric and these mysteries and alchemy, is that you're looking at that self that's quadrillion meters deep. It's inside of you. And so that's the interesting aspect of where we're going in this, this balance of ego and perspectives and personality constructs as we're, we're shifting through these unique periods. Um, but Jay, uh, I want to say within what we're looking at here in this unfoldment of reality, would you say that you feel that this, this embracing of the new woo, the new esoteric knowledge and these new ideas is going to help people steer the ship better? Is it, is it going to help them to function better by having an understanding of these things in the, the new future ahead? I think that the... <clears throat> Like I was saying before, they're, they're looking for a certain kind of person and they're doing weird tests on us to find those people. So you take like Bitcoin, the people who understood Bitcoin, understood what it was, they jumped in early and they're all getting rich, right? <clears throat> Where the people who jumped in late really aren't. So, it, it, so they're all going to have a, a fortune. <laughs> because they were perceptive enough to get in early and maybe even get out early. So I think that, I think that there's these self-selection processes going on to try to find a, the courageous, uh, perceptive human. Uh, that's who they want to lead the future and to go into the future. And I think that that's what they're looking for. I don't think they're looking for a certain race 
or a certain hair color or a certain height or, you know, IQ. I think they're looking for courage, actually. I think that's the highest quality that they, they value. The, the, the people that are running, the, the, the guard, the guardians, they value people who are courageous. And they're putting these tests out to see who's courageous and who isn't. And there's no, never been a better test than what we've been through for the last year. I mean, it really, has there ever been a better test? I don't think so. I went to, um, in January, I went to San Diego to get some sunshine. And the beach usually on on a 80 degree day in January has got 50,000 people at least there, right? But there was only 10,000. And I thought to myself, these are the brave ones. These are the ones that are saying, you know, screw it, I'm going to the beach, right? And, uh, and, and so there's this self-selection process going on where <clears throat> the meek will not inherit the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I just don't think it. So, um, yeah, and I think what what you're saying here is going to be very sobering to a lot of people. And, um, you know, I was watching a um, crazy show by a famous uh, a famous uh, um, radio show host who's been banned everywhere. He's kind of a big guy, you know. Mm -hmm. he says he's 47. Looks like he's 67. <clears throat> anyway, um, and he was really scaring the living daylights out of every, anyone listening about exactly what we're talking about right here. And he, yes, he was right. He proved that this is a long-term plan, the gate, uh, the head, the ex-CEO of a certain so crappy software company was behind a lot of it and everything. <clears throat> and it was certainly negative and scary. But at the same time, um, there does seem to be some kind of compassionate hidden hand at work. And so I, I don't want anyone to go away from this program filled with fear and trepidation. That's not the point. The point is just to inform you of what's going on the best way we can without getting banned off of everything. And um, for you to then make your own decisions of what you want to do. That's the whole point. And there is a future and it's rushing at us and we're doing our best to try to tell you what's going to be in that future. Absolutely, Jay. And, you know, there's lots of things that we can do to be mindful of this, you know, to spend time in nature. Uh, again, as our, our friend, my, our friends, Michelle and Simone, I always talk about that uh, gave you the plate as well as with the pyramids, which I, I do use those pyramids, you know, all the time, you know, the organ generators and everything. Um, I have one of her pyramids and I, I, I have it over here. And I want to say that as far as that, taking care of yourself, take care of your health, drink plenty of fresh water. There we go. Yeah, those work incredibly well. Do things like this to uh, meditate. Take some time alone to, to go into quietude, to find that inner guidance of your voice. To, to pray, to focus your energy, to, to look at the fact that we do have an amazing future ahead. Each one of you is an infinite consciousness. You know, you have so many great abilities and ideas and thoughts, and this is not the end by any means. It's not a time to crawl under a rock. It's a time to move forward into the future uh, and not to give in to fear. This is not the time to do that. I, I do want to say that, like you said, that we are being monitored to see who has type of AI systems in place that go beyond regular human understanding that are monitoring thoughts that are aware that when we have thoughts and stuff like that, I won't get into that today, the difference between AI and synthetic intelligence. There is a, there's a key difference in that. Uh, in fact, to monitor people who have been a certain way, uh, you could say that they even know who has been an ET contactee. I've been told very clearly that if you've had contact with extraterrestrials, that you're this, even if you've been off world, uh, you can see like you've left off world, for example, for a few hours to your family and friends, but you could have been gone for years. Uh, but if, if you do, there's certain changes in the body or atomic structure changes. So they have experts that can not only point someone out very quickly that has had that, but they have technology that can monitor that as well. Uh, I want to say, Jay, 
Aside from the weather changes we'll see coming up in America, this is not to be alarmed or around the world. These are just changes we're gonna see in the near future. And uh, there are different systems in place around the world that have been put there by our governments of the world. Uh, I wanna reiterate this, that the, while we might have some changes in people worrying about China two to three years from now and their expansion, uh, areas off of the areas of Alaska or in parts of northern Canada, we might look at certain spots that will come up ahead with that. Um, not to be alarmed with that as we move forward either. Uh, at the highest level, our governments work at unison, by the way. There's a certain pageantry that everybody sees in the world, but at the highest level, there is communication. <clears throat> yep. I was told to watch for crustal displacement uh, in Africa and the Mediterranean. There are activity connected to the Azores fault line coming up. Um, we are going to see a little bit more with sun discharging, the sun discharging with EMP materials. Um, you might say that this, there are means to offset that. We won't get into that today. But when you look over at Texas and parts of Canada, you might say that some of these power outages are due to that as well. Uh, we do have these lower level tornadoes, as I was mentioning with La Nino and the cooler version, uh, La Nina and the colder version of uh, La Nino. Uh, I also wanna mention a certain ET event. I've been told by my contacts uh, that are very similar to Jay's contacts that he has. I, I don't wanna make it sound like I have, you know, some sort of special privilege. I'm just an ordinary person like all of you. Uh, in pursuit of the truth and extraordinary ideas. So, uh, but I, as a researcher, I do do talk to people and have, you know, sort of special sit downs with folks as, as Jay does as well. What I have been told when I ask about ET events, if there's gonna be any big events, I was told toward the end of this year, uh, we would see a very large platform, let's call it that, 50 to 100 kilometers wide sort of thing. It'd be very, very visible. And it's something of great concern to certain folks that don't want this story coming out, that it would be closer towards the end of this year. And it's going to be because there's a large group of folks that want to leave here that are already here. And this would sort of be mingling up near where the space station is. And it's something where there would be uh, concerns that this might be a very visible event. So you might say that this is sort of a more uh, visible uh, disclosure event that's something you could look forward to uh, if it comes up. Other than that, I do know that throughout this year there is going to be more discoveries we'll be making uh, leading up in not only our, our scientific progress, uh, as far as travel goes, it's going to be sort of like the best way to travel um, as we move out of this certain uh, biogenetic political uh, structure that's being rolled out. The best way is to try to go direct as possible. If you have to travel somewhere, let's say to Egypt or another area, which uh, Jay and I will be going to Egypt on a, a wonderful uh, tour that we move the dates on so there's more direct flights available. Uh, we do know that travel restrictions in many places in North America and in the UK will be eased up towards the summer months due to the fact of the rollouts of the new immunity passports, which as we mentioned, you know, you can look to those to be uh, sticking around. Jay, I hope you don't mind. Can I give a plug over towards our <laughs> tour? We to. Yep. Return we have the return of the Kefir Cycle Tour coming up, and you can go to um, Beauty Egypt Tours or Return of the Kefir Cycle website, which Jay will put in the description below. We have a wonderful opportunity. Guys, I'm telling you right now, this is a great time to go to Egypt. Uh, I, I have two other tours coming up to Egypt into next year. Those are great tours. I'm very excited to do those tours as well. But this tour is, in many ways, not only is it economically amazing, it's, it's a great deal. Uh, we have permissions that, you know, are just fantastic, exclusive, amazing permission. Uh, you know, we have an amazing lineup of folks that are coming with us. We have, I mean, Jay is going to bring you all his mystery teachings. Um, at the same time, as our group goes into there, we are going to be exploring things that we may never have another chance to go to due to the, the limited number of people that are going to be around. Uh, Egypt has opened back up for tourism. Did any, any of you or Jay, did you see the new gem Egyptian museum ceremony that opened up? I did. I can't wait to see the new Egyptian museum. Oh, my God. It looks like it's going to be amazing. I'm told by my Egyptian friends that they're pulling all the stuff out of the basement and that they've been down there for years that we haven't been able to see. And so it's going to be, <clears throat> wow. 
that it is. And sometime uh, we, we're going to do a live stream. Uh, we're going to have everybody from our event that are coming up. We're going to have, uh, we'll do a live stream. We'll talk about this. There's so much to talk about in ancient Egypt that people don't normally talk about, like why the Soviet there. Why did they build the Aswan High Dam and flood everything out? What did they find there? We have so much stuff, uh, cross a Hendai stuff, stuff that we can go into that's going to be mind blowing. Yeah, it will be. And um, <clears throat> before we close here, I just want to say that I have been told, what, just like what Johnny heard, that they're going to uh, introduce us to the ETs before the end of the year, or at least one or two of the ETs. Um, so very exciting times, actually, if you think about it. Yeah, 2020 was a drag and uh, we were all stuck at home, but I think we're now, uh, you know, we're starting to get moving out. And um, can I say, it's not all dark and, 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 and dreadful. There's a, there's a lot of light and hope too, so. Yeah, yeah no, think... Jay, Jay, do you remember what Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, the Presbyterian minister always used to say, he said when he was watching television with his mother growing up and he would see something terrible on the news, his mother would always tell him, you know, look for the helpers, look for the people helping. You see the firefighters, the people on there, there always is, and they, as they teach us in the Tao, that, that seed of good in the world, and we can never give up. We can never give up faith, hope, charity, those great things that will lead us into the future, uh, that we can use our love to, to move through it. Exactly right. It's a great way to end. Uh, have no fear of the future. Uh, and uh, I'm Jay Widener. You've been watching Reality Check, and I know your head's spinning, uh, but that's the way it goes. Thanks for watching, and hit like, and subscribe, and all that other stuff. And I really do appreciate you guys watching. I really, really do. Thank you.